favorite systems that we study. Um, we talked about back in chapter one when we were learning about homeostasis and all that, and we talked about the control center. And our control center is what oversees a lot of our processes in our body, all right? And the nervous system is going to be, all right, one of two of our control centers for this course and for Bio 211, all right? When we talk about the control center, it's either going to be the nervous system or the endocrine system, all right? So we're going to discuss the nervous system. It's a communication system, all right? It governs and communicates throughout several structures throughout your whole body, all right? Not only that, it's that it is going to undergo regulation of body functions. And by doing so, its method of regulation, all right, how it communicates with other tissues and structures within the body is through electrical signals or activity. Okay? So the endocrine system uses chemical activity. The nervous system is going to use electrical activity. So if you look up here, all right, this should look familiar, these three bullet points here when we talk about functions. Collecting information, process and evaluate that information, and then initiate response to the information. That's homeostasis. Remember? Receptor, control center, effector. All right, that's homeostasis. Now we're just going into a little bit more of a detailed right, description of it. Okay, so how do we collect information? Okay, we have to have receptors that are going to do that. And we'll go into more detail about all the different receptors in our body when we get to chapter 16, when we talk about the special senses. But for right now, just know that a receptor is going to be something that's going to monitor a change in the internal or external environment. What is that change? We call that a stimuli. Okay, so you have to have a stimuli. You have to have some sort of change in the internal or external environment for that receptor to detect, to pick up on. And then what does it do? It detects that change, and it sends that information about what it found to the control center, okay? To our central nervous system, which is gonna be our brain and spinal cord. Okay, so we're gonna send those sensory signals to the brain and the spinal cord, which is our, our central nervous system. So it gets to the control center now, now that control center is going to process that information. That's going to figure out right, how am I going to respond to this? What type of outcome do we need? If it's a negative feedback loop, all right, do we need to now initiate some sort of effect in the opposite direction of the stimulus? Okay, the body's too hot, we need to cool it down. Or is it a positive feedback, like breastfeeding or uterine contractions? All right, are we going to perpetuate? or move the effect in that forward progression of whatever the stimuli was, okay? That's going to be more of the endocrine system's job when we talk about um, nursing and also uterine contractions, okay? But still, it doesn't mean that the central nervous system is not involved in, in positive feedback. So that's what's going to happen, all right? Our central nervous system is going to determine what type of response is going to occur, all right? And then it's going to initiate that response, and it's going to send that information through our motor nerves, right, to our effector organs. For our purposes, the effector organs are going to be muscles or glands. It's that simple. And we know that there's three different types of muscle. Okay, we've got our skeletal muscle, which is under voluntary control. All right, and then you've got cardiac muscle, and then we have smooth muscle. Okay, but for right now, we're just going to say muscles or glands are the effector organs. So that right there is just a nice quick review of homeostasis, something that you already knew about, all right, from chapter one. Collect the information, process and evaluate the information, figure out how you're gonna to respond to that stimuli, and then initiate a response to that collected information, okay? And so we get to learn about that. In the next couple of chapters, now we're gonna do the real stuff that I really enjoy, okay, for the rest of the course, I don't like the other stuff, all right? I really do enjoy it, okay? But we're going to start to really figure out how do things work. And this is going to be something that's important because this concept, this type of information is going to follow you into the other part of this course. When you get to 211, I'm always telling my 211 classes, see, 
This is how blood pressure works, okay? This is, and I go through it all. We have a receptor that monitors an increase in pressure in your blood vessels. This is how your body responds. And you'll start to see their eyes get big like, oh, damn, I remember that, all right? So we get to kind of utilize all this information. That's why it's really important that you kind of absorb this now and understand it now because then uh, chapter, not chapter, but uh, then the second part of this course, 5 to 11, will be that much easier for you. Okay? So when we talk about the nervous system, okay, we're going to break it down into the anatomy, which is the structural part of the nervous system, and then we're going to break it down into the physiology or the functional part of the nervous system. So when we talk about the anatomy or the structural part, we have two parts, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. How I remembered it is central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral is everything else. Everything else, which includes nerves and ganglia and the peripheral nervous system. So any named nerve, you ever heard, oh, I've got sciatica talking about the sciatic nerve, or if you're talking about the musculocutaneous nerve, the median nerve, if you have carpal tunnel, right? Those named nerves are all part of the peripheral nervous system, the dental nerve. I can go on and on and on. I won't, okay? So just keep in mind, central nervous system is two things, brain and the spinal cord, and then your peripheral nervous system is everything else, okay? Basically, a nerve is a bundle of axons. Now, you don't know what an axon is yet. We'll go over that, okay? And then a ganglia is a cluster of cell bodies. All right, I will repeat that many, many times through the rest of the semester. Many times, <laughs> all right? So you're gonna get tired of me saying that, and then I know I've done my job, okay? So you can see here in our picture, here's our guy with his brain and his spinal cord, and that's the central nervous system. And then you see these nerves coming off of parts of the brain and off of the spinal cord, all right, and those are the nerves, and there's little uh, bulges in certain areas, and those are going to be where the cell bodies are congregating, and that will be our, um, our ganglia. All right, so we talked about anatomy. Anatomy is the easier part. Physiology or the functional aspect of the nervous system. This is where it's going to be a little bit more difficult, all right? So we'll spend more time talking about this. All right, so this is where we talk about sensory versus motor. So think of sensory information as information that's coming from the external environment and the internal environment inside your body, and that information is going to be um, transmitted up to the central nervous system. So it's incoming information. Okay? And then think of motor information as information that's going to be leaving the central nervous system and going out to the periphery. But it's going to affect some sort of response. Maybe it's going to tell a gland to increase the production of something. Perfect example. The adrenal medulla produces norepinephrine and epinephrine. We know it as adrenaline. Okay? Well, your sympathetic nervous system right, will trigger that gland to produce that. All right, we could, we'll talk about the effects there, but that's part of the fight or flight response. We need to run faster. We need to get that heart beating. We need to circulate that blood more. Okay, so that's going to be a motor response when you eat food. Okay, and that food is in your stomach, and you start to release digestive enzymes. Well, it's part of the reflex arc. Okay, and the motor response is the central nervous system will be telling the glands to produce the digestive enzymes. It's also going to tell the stomach to start contracting and relaxing, to start churning and mixing the food, okay? So that's going to be the motor aspect. So when we talk about the sensory nervous system, you also need to know it as the afferent nervous system, okay? So information that's from the periphery or sensory information, which is received from or picked up by the receptors, is going to get transmitted to the central nervous system. So we're talking about the sensory nervous system or the afferent nervous system. Okay, there's two parts to it. Somatic and viscera. Viscera is another name that we use for organs. Liver, all right, heart, all right, stomach, pancreas. I can go on and on and on, okay? 
Somatic, all right, think body, or when you see this term somatic, you want to think of stuff that you can consciously perceive. So if sensory information is getting transported or transmitted to your somatic sensory nervous system, then that's stuff that you consciously perceive. Sight, sound, my voice, touch, okay, as you're feeling your cold desk, right, as you're taking notes, okay, all that sensory information is getting transport or uh, transmitted to the somatic sensory system, okay? Now, the visceral sensory is stuff that we do not consciously perceive, all right? You can't tell when your heart goes from 56 beats a minute to 61 beats per minute. You don't know that. Okay? You can't feel that. You can't tell when your arterioles vasodilate and vasoconstrict by a hundredth of a centimeter. You don't know that, okay? You can't tell when your stomach is actually starting to decrease its production of hydrochloric acid, all right, in regards to digesting a meal. So these are all things that you aren't able to consciously perceive. So that information travels within the visceral sensory system. Okay, so now let's go to the other component, the motor nervous system. Think of effect, all right? So we're going to have some sort of effect. So we call that the efferent nervous system, okay? So this is the part of the a nervous system that is going to transmit motor information from the central nervous system out to the effectors. Well, that's easy to remember what our effectors are because I only gave you two Muscles or glands. That's it. Okay? That's it. So, the somatic motor system, again, is going to be voluntary, something that we have conscious control over. So, the only type of tissue out of our effector glands, muscles, and glands that we have conscious control over is the skeletal muscle tissue. Do we have conscious control over the cardiac muscle tissue? Can I slow my heart down? All right, my heart's beating probably about 52 beats a minute. I want it to go to 46. Can someone please tell me how I do that? Tell me. All right, how about smooth muscle? All right, how can I get my small intestines all right, to slow down peristalsis? Peristalsis is the process of moving food through the digestive tract. How do I do that? I can take drugs, but I can't consciously do that. Okay? And glands. Someone please tell me how I can get my thyroid gland to produce more thyroxin. I want to speed up my metabolism. Someone have a secret? If you can do, please share it with me. See what I'm saying? You can't consciously do any of that. So the only thing that we can consciously control is going to be our skeletal muscles. Right now, you all are doing it. You're taking notes. You're writing things down. All right? You're shifting your mask to correct it. All right, you're lifting up your glasses, they're sliding down on your nose. That's skeletal muscle movement, okay? So the autonomic motor is going to, and the other name for that is visceral motor. That's involuntary, okay? So that's going to include the tissues that you do not have conscious control of. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, okay? So there's two divisions to the autonomic motor system, and that's going to be the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. We've got a later chapter to talk about that. So we're not going to worry about that right now. But for right now, just know that there's two divisions to the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic, that's the fight or flight. And then we have the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. All right? So after a nice meal, all right, and, you're, and you've eaten something very tasty, and you're kind of relaxing, your parasympathetic nervous system is kind of taking over. It's doing a lot of work. When you're going out and working out, going for a run, bike ride, sympathetic kind of takes over, fight or flight, okay? So we'll, 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 we'll revisit that right now. But no, for the autonomic motor, heart, smooth muscle, and glands. For the somatic motor, skeletal muscle, okay? One, we can consciously control for the motor. That's the somatic. And the other one, we cannot. Questions about that? Good? Am I going too slow? Too fast? 
Right, just perfect. All right, Goldilocks, just right. Okay. All right, so that's what this picture is showing us. All right, figure 12, 1B. Okay, you can see for the functional organization, this is physiology. The input, that's the sensory information that's coming from the periphery into the, uh, the control center or our central nervous system. Somatic sensory, this is the information that we can consciously perceive. Okay, touch, temperature, vibration, okay, smell, sight, sound. Okay, visceral sensory is what we cannot consciously perceive. Okay, how much stretch is going on on blood vessel walls? How much stretch is occurring within your uh, digestive system on the large or small intestine? Okay, so we can't perceive that unless it's to the point where it's grossly all right, inflated. That's a different story, and we'll talk about that, but not today. All right, then we have our output portion, the motor aspect. Okay, and we have two divisions there. The somatic motor is what we can consciously or voluntarily control. So that means there's only one tissue type out of all the ones that we know, skeletal muscle. And then for the autonomic motor, okay, we have the effectors that we cannot control, involuntary, which is going to be heart, smooth muscle, and glands. Okay. So I got a question for you. Well, the answer is going to be put up there. <laughs> uh, so what are the two primary functional divisions of the nervous system and how do they differ? Okay, so sensory versus motor are the two primary divisions. Remember, sensory is inputs coming in, and then motor is outputs leaving the control center or the uh, central nervous system. Okay, so the sensory nervous system's job is to detect stimuli. And then it's going to transport, I keep saying transport, excuse me, transmit that sensory or that stimuli information from the periphery, the receptors, to the central nervous system input okay then the motor is then going to transmit information from the central nervous system to the effectors right and it's going to carry the information as to how you are going to respond to whatever that stimuli is okay okay so let's start off with some some basic since we're talking about the nervous system let's do some basic definitions here We'll talk about some of the structures that are part of the nervous system here. So nerves and ganglia. When you see that, your next thought should be peripheral nervous system, PNS. Okay, that's outside, that's outside of the central nervous system. Okay, so a nerve, here's the definition, you need to know this. Because anatomists right, like to change the definition of things depending on where you are in the body and you'll learn this later okay so a nerve is a bundle of parallel axons all right in the peripheral nervous system the axons are the part of the neuron which is the cell of the nervous system that transmits the electrical information what we call the action potential but for right now we'll call it the nerve signal so when we're dealing with nerves, we have three layers or wrappings that cover the structures of a nerve. So the rule of threes is pretty prevalent in biology, especially in this course. Meaning, when we talk about a lot of structures, there's always three things associated with it. right? Like the dura mater, the pia mater, and the arachnoid mater, which are the coverings to your brain and central nervous system. right? So we'll talk about this for mu muscles too. For, for right now, you have three connective tissue wrappings around your nerves. Okay? So the outermost, epi, outside, which is going to go around the entire nerve, is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. That's good. You want it, because remember, dense, irregular connective tissue is a hardy tissue. It's tough. All right? It can handle stuff. So we want to cover our entire nerve with that because nerves are very sensitive structures, okay? So we have to take care of them. We have to be very, very careful with them. All right, so then inside of the nerve, right, we have these bundles, all right, 
of, 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 of the cell axons, okay, which we call fascicles. All right. So you have a bunch of these long processes, all right, and then we've wrapped up a bundle of them, a couple of them, and we put it into this bundle, which we call the perineurium. Okay? That's also made up of dense irregular. Then each individual axon, all right, just one of those little lines, all right, that's covered by a loose connective tissue, the areolar. Well, this is nice because it helps to insulate the axon because we don't want nerve signals jumping from one nerve to the other. That could be a problem. We might not want to stimulate that neuron because it might do something different. So we're going to insulate each axon so it doesn't irritate its neighbors. All right, and it physically will separate each neuron or each axon from each neuron from one another. Okay? We'll get into a little bit more detail in the lab about this. Don't forget that we talked about certain tissues in the body are highly vascularized and certain tissues are not. Some tissues are avascular, like mature cartilage. Okay? Nerves are highly vascularized. They need their blood. Why? Why do you think? Nutrients, right? They got to get some. They got to eat because they're working all the time. They're working all the time. Okay, so the blood vessels are going to be present in the outermost layer, okay, and in the middle layer, all right, and that's going to allow exchange of nutrients, ions, proteins. Remember, we're, bring, we're, we're, we're bringing in the groceries and taking out the trash, okay? The nutrients are going to be the groceries. We're going to bring them into the nerve, and then at the same time, we got to get rid of the wastes, okay? So these capillaries are going to do that for us. Think of capillaries, and this is what I tell my two uh, 11 classes, as exchange sites. Okay? All right, we're going to see exchange of nutrients in waste. So it's an exchange site for things. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, all right? Ammonium, nitrogen, all sorts of stuff. Sodium, potassium, all that stuff. Shoot, even iodine, if we're going to talk about the, um, the thyroid gland. Okay, so here you can see a little bit better of a picture here when we're talking about our nerve. Here's our entire nerve, okay? So it's covered by the epineurium, and this thing is filled with tens of thousands, thousands, depending on how big the nerve is, of axons. So then we have around several, of, many of these axons, these, these bundles here, which we call the perineurium. And then you can see if we pull out each individual axon, then we'll have it wrapped with a loose connective tissue, which is the endoneurium. And then throughout, we'll have blood vessels here in between our fascicles, all right, and we'll see them wrapped inside along the, uh, in the blood vessel, excuse me, inside the fascicles too, okay? So this is basically showing you, I'll zoom in on that one, or zoom out, excuse me. This is showing you all these different, all right, axons, individual axons. And this little example here is showing you a ganglion, which is the cell bodies. We'll get into the actual anatomy for different um, types of, uh, of uh, neurons, okay? We'll save that for you. Okay. So staying here in our peripheral nervous system, talking about nerves and ganglia, all right, when we talk about the actual anatomical or the structural classification of nerves, again, the anatomy part I think is the easier part to understand. Okay? So there's two types. If you see a nerve coming off the brain, we call it a cranial nerve. If it comes off the spinal cord, we call it a spinal nerve. Simple. That's it. All right? We're not going to put a lot of thought into that. So that's why it's always easier to know that. Okay? So cranial nerves, brain, spinal nerves, spinal cord. Now, when we get into the functional or the, the physio physiological classification, it's a little bit more complicated, but not a lot, because we've already seen some of this information. 
The sensory nerves, if you, we say that the, I don't know, the green nerve is a sensory nerve, then that means that that nerve is only going to carry sensory information only. So what does that mean? It's going to take information from the periphery, out from the body, and it's going to bring it up to the central nervous system. Okay? So think of sensory nerves as input, bringing information to the brain and spinal cord. If we talk about the blue nerve, and we say the blue nerve is a motor nerve, that means that it only has motor neurons only, and that it transmits information from the central nervous system out to the body somewhere. Okay? So it's going to go from the central nervous system out to the body. Now, if we talk about the sciatic nerve or the musculocutaneous nerve or some sort of nerve, right, and we say, oh, here, I'll give you the generic one, spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are mixed nerves, which means, okay, if it's a mixed nerves, it has both sensory and motor neurons, which means it has, it, that, that specific nerve is carrying information that's going up to the central nervous system, and it's carrying information leaving the central nervous system. Okay? So like those names of those nerves that I just threw out at you, the sciatic nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, most of the named nerves in your body are mixed nerves. Okay? Mixed nerves. Okay? But keep in mind, when we talk about the individual axons, all right, an individual axon is a part of the neuron, all right, that transmits the electrical information, okay? Individual axons will only transmit one type of information. You need to know that. It's either a motor axon or a sensory axon. It's never both, okay? So a neuron is only going to carry one type of information, motor or sensory. It cannot be mixed. But a nerve can, because it could carry thousands of axons. So it could have sensory axons and motor axons. So it could be a mixed nerve. Okay? Know this, please. A ganglion. I said this before. Make sure you know this. All right? A ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. We call it something different when we get into the central nervous system. So we already know two definitions now. A neuron is a bundle of parallel axons in the peripheral nervous system. That's the first definition that you have to know. Okay? In the peripheral nervous system, a cluster of cell bodies, excuse me, neuron cell bodies, okay, is called a ganglion. Those two, because now when we get into the central nervous system, we're going to call them something different. All right? But I'll tell you that when we get there. I want this to settle in, okay? Every semester, people get confused, and I want to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, good so far? Not too bad? Okay, so now we're going to switch, not switch gears, really. We're going to talk about some of the characteristics of neurons, all right, and what kind of these I can guarantee you, you'll probably see one to two questions on your test about this about some of the characteristics here okay so the first one that's listed up there is called excitability okay and this talks about how ready how ready is that neuron all right to detect a stimulus and then respond to that stimulus all right, so we refer to that as responsiveness all right, when we're discussing excitability. And we'll talk about this term. If you don't know what the, this term here, cells, membrane potential, don't worry about it. We're going to spend a long time talking about that. Okay? But for right now, what will happen is think of the membrane potential as the electrical charge across the membrane, the plasma membrane of our neuron. Okay, and so a stimulus is going to change that electrical charge, but we'll discuss that later. Okay, so next, conductivity. How well 
can a neuron propagate the electrical signal, that nerve signal there? Okay. How is it going to be able to carry that signal down the entire length of the neuron? All right, to go from point A to point B. That's called conductivity. It's like an electrical wire in your house. Okay, when you flip the light switch on, okay, I mean, we're looking at the, the conductivity of that wire that goes from that light switch up to your light. Right? Similar situation when we're talking about a neuron. Okay, so in this case, oh, what the heck are these things? Voltage gated channels? Those are proteins. Remember the types of proteins in the plasma membrane? We had the trans, we had the, the integral, okay? And those are the types of proteins that span the entire width or thickness of the plasma membrane. That's what these are. That's all they are. They're just integral proteins, all right? But a channel can be open or closed, all right? Voltage-gated channels are normally closed. And then when we get a change in the electrical activity, they'll open up. And then we'll talk about what happens. All right, secretion. Now we're going to get down to the end of the neuron. So the electrical signal travels down the length of our neuron wire, so to speak. And then it's going to secrete something at the very end. All right, we call those neurotransmitters. This is how one neuron communicates to the next neuron or how one neuron will activate, all right, a receptor, not a receptor, excuse me, an effector organ. How is it going to uh, uh, activate a gland or a muscle, okay? So it involves secretion. Basically, that electrical signal, the conductive activity, is going to reach the end of the neuron, and it's going to stimulate the release of the neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter which is a chemical messenger, is going to influence the target cell, which could be another neuron. It could be a cell, all right, of, of a gland or a cell of a muscle, okay? So the last two characteristics that are listed on this slide here, extreme longevity and amitotic. I don't think I need to explain to you about the extreme longevity. Neurons live for a long time. Okay? You're pretty much born with all your neurons. I say pretty much. Okay? Right? You're not going to all of a sudden just grow a whole bunch of new neurons, right? unless we're dealing with stem cells, but we're not talking about that. Okay? So they live a long time. That's why it's very important that you take care of your neurons. All right? You, you, you cradle them. You get plenty of sleep, you sing them to bed, that kind of thing. They're very important to you. Amitotic means, all right, that they don't divide. All right. In extreme situations, they will. All right. In the amygdala of your brain, we have seen that some of the cells will divide. But for the most part, for the most part, okay, that neurons are amitotic. They will not undergo mitosis. Okay. All right. So this whole time I've been talking about these different parts to these neurons, but I haven't been describing, all right, the anatomy. Guess what? Now I am. Okay. All right. So the first part is the cell body. I'll do my best to draw a decent picture for you, or I can just go to the actual picture itself. All right, you need to know this term, soma. It's another name for the cell body, okay? So I'll go through each description here, and then I'll show you the picture first, okay? The cell body is going to be enclosed by the plasma membrane. So inside that plasma membrane, we have cytoplasm. Well, in the neuron, we give it a special name, perikaryon, okay? In the cell body, we are going to see the, the cells control center, the nucleus, all right? In addition to that, we are going to see some of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, but on the endoplasmic reticulum, we are going to see when we stain it with a specific type of, of dye, all right, it colors it red, kind of purplish color, okay? And these, you'll see these little dots, 
on the endoplasmic reticulum, which is that tubular network. And these dots, all right, we call them chromatophilic substance or nissel bodies. And basically what that is are just ribosomes. And if you recall from chapter four, ribosomes make proteins. That's the job. Okay? So if they're bound, all right, onto the, endo, the endoplasmic reticulum, then those proteins are going to be uh, secreted out, either out, they're going to head outside the cell, or they're going to head to the plasma membrane. If they're free, floating around, then those proteins are going to be meant to hang out inside of the cytoplasm. Okay? But point being is, chromatophilic substance or nissel bodies are ribosomes. Okay? It is here in the cell body that we are going to try to generate the hallowed, coveted action potential. The action potential is the nerve signal. Okay? That's what a neuron does. That's its job, is to transmit action potentials. It's real simple. It has one job to do. Okay? So, in the cell body, we're going to try to encourage and build up that anticipation for the generation of that action potential, okay? But here's the thing. The action potential doesn't occur in the cell body. It occurs somewhere, somewhere else, right? So think of the cell body as the warm-up act, okay? You go to a concert and you want to go see uh, Weezer or Blink-182. All right, you've always got a warm-up act, someone that you probably never heard of, okay? Well, that's what we call the graded potentials. So the graded potentials are not quite the same as action potentials, but here's the thing. They occur in the cell body, okay? And so if we get enough graded potentials, hopefully we'll be able to generate an action potential, all right, which is that nerve signal. We'll talk more about that later on, okay? All right, also in the cell body, well, all right, hold on. Let me go to my picture here, I'll come back. So here's our cell body. Okay, this kind of blobby structure here. You like some of my descriptions? Blobby. All right. So that's this fat, thickened portion here. It's not including these little spiky things coming off. Those are the dendrites. We'll talk about that in a second. So in our cell body or the soma, we have our nucleus with our nucleolus. We'll have our endoplasmic reticulum. You can't really quite see the nissel bodies here. All right. Well, yeah, you can. Right down in here. Okay, those are those, those ribosomes that are going to be found within the perikaryon or the cytoplasm. Okay, so off of the cell body, you'll see these processes coming off. Okay, these little spikes. Those are dendrites. Then you can see at one end of the cell body, you've got this big, huge, long process. That's the, that's the axon. Okay, that's going to transmit the action potential, our nerve signal. We'll get to that in a second. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about the dendrites here, okay? So the dendrites, and this is a very important descriptor here, are short and unmyelinated. That's important. Myelination is a fatty substance that sits on certain parts of the neuron. It helps to insulate the cell, it helps to speed up the, the uh, action potential or the nerve signal. We'll get into more detail about that. But for right now, all right, it's only going to be located in one place, and that's going to be on the axon. So you will not see myelin on the cell body, and you will not see myelin on the dendrites. Make note of that. Okay, because when you're looking at nervous tissue grossly with your own bare eyes, okay, you'll see that some tissue looks gray and some tissue looks white. If it's white, that means it's myelinated. If it's gray, that means it's unmyelinated. So if you're looking at nervous tissue and you see globs of gray, all right, little islands of gray inside of white tissue, then you'll say that's unmyelinated, but what's unmyelinated? Oh, I know it's unmyelinated, cell bodies and dendrites, okay? 
and also unmyelinated axons because there's some cells that aren't myelinated. But for right now, so that's why it's important that you know that dendrites are unmyelinated and the cell body is unmyelinated, okay? So the dendrites are these processes that come off of the cell body, okay? And so they're going to receive input, okay, and transfer that information to the cell body in the hopes of initiated, initiating, excuse me, graded potentials, okay? Reminder, graded potentials are not action potentials. That's not the nerve signal. It's the warm-up act. We're trying to get an action potential, and the graded potentials will help us. It's not the same, okay? So these dendrites receive input from wherever. It could be from another neuron, all right? It could be from receptor, something. All right, it's going to receive that input, and it's going to transfer that information to the cell body. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here in this picture. Well, we're not really seeing it. Okay, but these dendrites are then are going to receive input, and they're going to transmit that information to the cell body in the hopes that we can initiate an action potential right here. Well, you heard me talk about the axon, so now what the heck is that thing? All right, it's the largest process that comes off the cell body, all right, and it's long. All right, in some cases, an axon can be as long as your arm, and it can be as long as your leg. It's pretty long, okay? So the axon is going to then make contact, or what we call synapse, with one of three structures, another neuron, a muscle cell or a gland, okay? So the area where the axon, uh, excuse, yeah, where the axon kind of be begins, here's our cell body, a couple dendrites coming off, all right, and then you have this triangular area here where the cell body starts to taper down into the axon. And that triangular area is called the axon hillock. You better put a star next to that. Because that's where your action potential is initiated. Guarantee you that most of you, when you take the chapter 10, or excuse me, the chapter 12 and chapter 10 lecture three test, there'll be a question on that. Your action potential is initiated in the axon hillock. Okay? All right. So, being part of the cell, okay? Inside of the axon, we have cytoplasm. We, of course, change its name to axioplasm. And we give the name of the plasma membrane located along the axon another name. We call that the axolemma. Okay? And in the muscles, we give it another name. But we'll talk about that when we do chapter 10. Okay? So the cytoplasm in the axon is called axioplasm. And the plasma membrane is called the axolemma. Now, some axons have what we call collaterals. They're just branches that just go off. All right? And they'll go to either another neuron, or they'll go to a muscle cell, or they'll go to a gland. Okay? So we call those axon collaterals. So at the very end of our axon, all right, as we get to the end, all right, the axon splits into these small little branches. And we call those teledendra. And at the ends of the teledendra, we got these kind of swellings there. Okay? And those swellings, all right, at the very end are the synaptic knobs, or the what we call the synaptic end bulb. And inside is where we have our neurotransmitter, okay? That chemical I was telling you about, okay? So we have these, this neurotransmitter that's packaged up into what we call synaptic vesicles. Think of the neurotransmitter as the letter and that the synaptic vesicles as the envelope, okay? And there are thousands of those sitting inside of the synaptic knobs, right? And they're just sitting there until an action potential 
comes down to liberate them. Okay? As long as there's no action potential, that neurotransmitter is just going to sit inside those synaptic vesicles, just chilling out, just relaxing, nothing's going to happen. Okay? So we need an action potential, all right, to free or release the neurotransmitter from the synaptic knobs. Okay? I was gonna make I was gonna try to make a Star Wars analogy there, but I can't think of a good one. So, anyways. All right. Good so far. You can see that the axon's a pretty important structure when we're talking about neurons. Okay, it's very, very crucial that you understand the anatomy of this structure here. I'm gonna come back to the slide here, but let me just show you kind of what I'm talking about with a few parts here. Okay, so here you can see. Here's the axon hillock. That's where the cell body starts to taper down. This is where we're going to initiate our action potential. And so when that action potential is initiated, that nerve signal will travel down the axon. Here's an axon collateral. It's just a branch coming off. Okay? And then it'll travel down all the way to the very end to the teledendra. All right? These, these little branches here that split off. And at the very end of the teledendra, you can see, well, it's tough to see, but you can see you have these little bulbs here, these little swellings. That's what this picture is showing us. This is the end of the teledendron. You have all right, the synaptic knob here. And inside, it has these little bubbles. Okay, Those are the synaptic vesicles. And so inside the synaptic vesicles are the neurotransmitter. And so when they're stimulated by an action potential, it's going to release that neurotransmitter, that chemical, into this space here. All right, and think of the neurotransmitter as the key. And these little blue structures down here, are, are, those are the doors, but they're all locked. So the neurotransmitter gets released. It attaches onto the receptors here on these little gates. And it unlocks them, and they open up. And we'll talk about that whole phenomenon. Okay, so it's really, really important that you understand all of these terms that I just went over with, okay? But really, insert it into your brain that the axon hillock is where we initiate the action potential. And the action potential will travel down the entire length of the axon, all right? Like electricity travels throughout a wire, okay? It reaches the end. And when it gets to the synaptic knob, okay, it releases the neurotransmitter that is living or housed inside of the synaptic vesicles, those bubbles there. And that neurotransmitter will then be released, and we'll talk about how it does its thing later on. Okay. So this other part here, when we talk about the cytoskeleton, you thought that you didn't have to remember what the heck the cytoskeleton was. The cytoskeleton is the actual skeletal structure of the cell. All right, and we talked about all right these different filaments, the microfilaments, the intermediate filaments, and microtubules. All right, point being is the intermediate filaments, those are like the the mid-range size, all right, parts of the cytoskeleton. We give them a name of the neurofilaments here. Okay. And what they do is help to provide that tensile strength to the neuron, meaning that we don't snap the neuron. We don't break the neuron. Okay? And then when you get into Chapter 17, you get to talk about how the cytoskeleton helps to contribute with the movement of the hormones of oxytocin, an antidiuretic hormone, from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. Kind of cool. Cool, cool stuff. All that travels through a neuron. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about the cell body. We've talked about the dendrites. We've talked about the axon hillock. We've talked about the axon. We even talked about the synaptic knobs. So we've talked about the, the neuron completely. So now what I want to talk about, okay, because we, we're, we're going from one end to the other, now I want to talk to you about what a synapse is. Okay? The synapse is an important structure because that's how a neuron communicates with another neuron or how it communicates 
with a gland or how it communicates with a muscle cell, okay? So a synapse, first of all, all right, is a connection, all right, between a neuron and some sort of effector organ, muscle, gland, or another neuron, right? Okay? There's two types. Chemical is the one that we're going to be talking about mostly, okay? Electrical is real easy, so we'll talk about the electrical one first, right? Okay? But keep in mind, an electrical synapse is way faster, way faster than a chemical one, okay? Because there's virtually no delay. With a chemical synapse, there's a little bit of a delay because we have to turn an electrical signal into a chemical signal, and then hopefully back to another electrical signal of some sort, depending on what uh, our effector or what the other neuron is doing, okay? It depends on what the, the, the neuron is synapsing on. So with the electrical synapse, real easy, it's in the brain and the eyes, okay? So first of all, let me tell you, presynaptic versus postsynaptic. If we describe a neuron as a presynaptic neuron, that's the neuron before the synapse, okay? So here's the cell body, here's the axon, all right? Here's where the synapses are. Here's the other cell body of another neuron, all right? Axon, and then we'll make this a muscle cell, okay? So this first neuron here, okay, that is the presynaptic neuron. Get it? Because it's before the synapse. Okay? The second neuron, this one here, that's the postsynaptic neuron. Okay? I just want to make sure that you folks get that. Because <clears throat> if you're like me, sometimes I'll read something through and I don't even really stop to think about it. I just memorize it. But now you know. Okay? So presynaptic neuron is the first neuron, okay? Or our primary neuron here. The postsynaptic neuron is the secondary, is the second neuron or our secondary neuron, okay? So we talk about the electrical synapse. These types of synapses between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron, all right, we refer to them as gap junctions. You'll see those, all right, quite a bit in the brain and the eyes. There's also, you'll see, uh, there's some gap junctions. It's on a different, I uh, won't even mention that, forget, just brain and eyes, all right? I don't want to try to draw some other information in here. But here's the nice thing about it. No synaptic delay, okay? It's pretty much like if you were to touch two electrical wires to each other, okay? The electrical signal will jump from wire one or wire A to wire B or wire two, okay? Virtually no decrease all right in the speed of the signal so electrical synapses are awesome all right not to say that chemical synapses aren't but chemical synapses are going to be a little bit slower okay so looking at the players here we have a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron so here's our first guy here's our presynaptic neuron okay that's the synapse here's the postsynaptic. So the presynaptic is going to produce the signal, the postsynaptic is going to receive it, all right? Now it's going to receive it, all right, either on, directly onto the cell body, or it could receive it uh, onto a dendrite, or both, okay? It just depends. This picture here, actually let me show you this one right here. If you look at this picture here, was that me? That was me. I apologize. Dang. I forgot to shut off my phone last night, too. I'm dropping the ball, y'all. Um, if you look here at this picture, you can see... Whoops. All right, you can see... Here's our presynaptic neuron. And you can see all these teledendra coming down. Some of them are synapsing onto the dendrite. Some are synapsing directly onto the cell body. Okay? So, and not all of these have to synapse directly onto one neuron. They can synapse onto different neurons. Depends on how close they are, okay? But this picture here, we're seeing the presynaptic neuron, this guy, synapsing onto this postsynaptic neuron here, okay? 
and then the same thing will happen. Okay, it'll synapse onto its effector or another neuron. This, in this case, it's another neuron. Okay, but you can see some are, some are on the dendrite, some are on the cell body. Okay, so there is going to be. Uh, I apologize to do this, to you guys. <laughs> I'll come back to that slide. All right. It's not going to be a direct connection. Okay. What I mean is between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron or the effector, there's a little bit of a space here. Okay. There's a little bit of a space. It's not pressing directly on top. That is called the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft all right, is where the presynaptic neuron releases its neurotransmitter. It releases it into the cleft. It's a fluid-filled space, okay? So the neurotransmitter gets released into that space, okay, as it's being released from the synaptic vesicles. And what will happen is that neurotransmitter will diffuse. You remember what that term means. It's going to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So what that means is it's going to move across the cleft, and it's going to bind onto the postsynaptic receptors, which are these things, these little tiny blue structures in our picture. Okay? These little blue uh, structures, all right, those are going to be, the receptors will be on these blue structures here. Okay, so that neurotransmitter is released into the cleft here, and then they'll bind onto, you can't really see it, it'll bind onto these channels here where the receptors are. All right. And then what will happen is it will cause some sort of response. Hopefully, if we're dealing with another neuron, it will start to generate what we call a graded potential. Remember what I was saying? The graded potential is the warm-up act for the action potential. Our goal, if our synapse is on another neuron, is to carry on the action potential, if that's what we need to do. All right? So we need to carry on that action potential. That means we first have to generate an action potential. We'll talk about our graded potential. Okay? So since we're dealing with a chemical synapse and we're going from an electrical signal to a chemical one and then probably back into an electrical one, all right, there's a little bit of a delay. And we call that synaptic delay. Okay? It takes a little bit of time for those synaptic vesicles to move to the end of the neuron, release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, the synapt then that neurotransmitter has to diffuse across the cleft, then it has to uh, attach onto the receptor, and then cause some sort of effect. So that synaptic delay takes a little bit of time. It's really fast, but it still takes a little bit of time. Okay? That's where we slow down a little bit. <clears throat> So let me ask you a question. What is the mode of transmission in a chemical synapse? Basically that story that I just told you. Okay. The molecules, which are our neurotransmitter, are stored inside of these synaptic vesicles, okay, inside the synaptic knob. And what they'll do is, when the action potential reaches that area, it will cause the migration of the synaptic vesicles to the end of the synaptic knob, They'll release the neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter will then diffuse across the synaptic cleft, all right, and it'll bind onto the receptors in our postsynaptic membrane. That's it. We'll talk about this story a couple more times in a little bit more detail. So if you just kind of have the general idea, it's like carrying a bucket of water and passing it off to somebody else, okay? I'm going to pass it off to you, and then you'll do whatever you need to do, okay? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, the one with synaptic delay, yes. Oh, good. We're getting into pumps and channels. Talk about proteins. So now that we kind of understand the general anatomy of a neuron, okay, 
Now we have to understand some of the parts and components that are going to help to make our action potential. Okay? So to do that, we have to talk about the machinery that's going to be involved. And that machinery are going to be pumps and channels. These are transport proteins. All right? These pumps and channels are going to move substances across the plasma membrane of the neuron. Okay? So the first type are the pumps. Remember from chapter four? A pump is part of the active transport process, which means it requires energy right here. And it also means that it's going to move substances against their concentration gradient. So that basically says, I'm going to move something from an area of low concentration into an area of high concentration. Okay? I, I've got three apples, you've got 20, I'm going to give you two more of my apples. That's what I'm doing. I'm giving you more of something that you already have. That's what these pumps are going to do. Okay, so they're going to move things against the concentration gradient. But here's an important thing, and this is very important. The pumps maintain that concentration gradient. They keep pumping more stuff into that area of high concentration. So by doing that, they're making sure that on one side of the plasma membrane, you've got a lot of stuff. And on the other side of the plasma membrane, you hardly have any. So they're maintaining, or I won't say creating, but they're maintaining that concentration gradient. That's important because we're going to talk about another process called diffusion. You remember what that is? Moving a substance down its concentration gradient. That's a passive process. That doesn't require energy. This does, right? So there's two types of pumps in the neuron. The sodium-potassium ion pump and the calcium pumps. All right, I'll tell you where those are, but for right now, you need to know both of those. Sodium, potassium, okay? And basically, the sodium, potassium pump is going to pump sodium out of the cell, and it's going to pump potassium into the cell. The calcium ion pump is going to pump calcium out of the cell. Okay, so it's always going to, these pumps are going to be moving things against their concentration gradient. So if I'm telling you that it's going to pump sodium out of the cell, oh my gosh, that just reminds me. Usually I've already said this by now, but I haven't. I um, want you to remember something. I'm going to tell you something, and, we'll exp and I'll explain it to you as the semester goes on, well, as the class goes on. I want you to remember a banana, that's an off picture of banana, <laughs> floating in the ocean. Okay? For you at home, a banana floating in the ocean. Okay? What's a banana rich in? Potassium. K plus, that's the chemical sign for it. Okay? So, what's in the ocean? Obviously. Water. What kind of water? Salt. Salt water. Does anyone remember the chemical formula or the molecular formula for salt? NaCl. Yep. Sodium chloride. Na. All right. Cl. The cell is the banana. Lots of potassium inside the cell. The ocean is outside the cell. A lot of sodium and chloride outside the cell. A lot of potassium inside the cell. Banana floating in the ocean. Well, I tell them, the okay. So that's what the sodium ion, sodium potassium ion pump does. It pumps sodium, all right, out of the cell, and it pumps potassium into the cell. It helps to maintain that concentration gradient. The calcium pump is going to do the same thing. It's going to maintain that concentration gradient. It's going to pump calcium out of the cell. Wants calcium out of the cell. We'll get into the reasons for that soon. Okay. So the other part, or the other parts of the machinery are the channels. Okay? So now the channels, this is important. Think of them as holes, 
all right, in the plasma membrane. Okay, obviously they're made of proteins because they're transport proteins. So they're going to allow ions, because if you remember from chapter four, channels are specific for one type of ion. They're ion specific. So not everything can just enter in through this channel. So they're going to allow ions to move down their concentration gradient. So that means that you can have stuff moving into the cell and you can have stuff moving out of the cell. So if it's going to move down its concentration gradient, then it's a passive process. It doesn't require energy. Okay? Specific type of ion, folks. You have to know that. You can't have sodium going through a potassium leak channel. You can't have calcium going through a sodium leak channel. It's specific to one type of ion. Okay? So there's three types. Our leak channels, love these guys, okay? They're always open. When I say they're always open, they're like 7-Eleven, 24-7, open for business, okay? All of the time. So that means, and we have sodium leak channels and potassium leak channels. That means you always have sodium moving into the cell and potassium moving out of the cell through the leak channels. They're going to go down their concentration gradient. But at the same time, you've got the sodium potassium ion pump um, moving things against the concentration gradient. It's like you're on a boat. The boat is sinking. There's two of you on there. You're pumping the water. And the other person that you're with, that idiot keeps poking holes into the boat. That's what's going on with the leak channels. They keep doing that. Not that they're poking holes in the boat, but they keep letting water in. And in this case, with the sodium and the potassium leak channels, they keep letting sodium into the cell. They keep letting potassium leave the cell. And then the whole time, you got the sodium potassium ion pump pumping sodium out and pumping potassium in, okay? All right, the other two types of channels are gated channels, which means if the channel is resting, it's closed. So the first word here in the title tells you what you need to open up these gates. So if I'm dealing with a chemically gated channel, then I need some sort of chemical to open up this gate. If I'm dealing with a voltage gated channel, then I need some sort of electrical charge to open up gate. Okay? So when we're dealing with chemically gated channels, we need neurotransmitters. That's a chemical, right? We just talked about that. If I'm dealing with voltage gated channels, then I need to change the charge of the plasma membrane. Remember, I told you there's a certain charge, and we'll talk about that. A certain electrical charge to the plasma membrane of our neurons. We'll, I'll get more into that. Okay. So when we change the charge, okay, that will cause that type of gate to open up. And when it does, whatever type of gate that that is specific for, it will allow, allow that ion to pass through. So if I have a voltage-gated sodium channel, what travels through that channel? Sodium, it's not your question. Yeah, sodium, right on, right on. You guys got it. I'm going to make this simple for you, okay? So if I have a chemically-gated chloride channel, what enters in? Chloride. That's it, okay? Okay? Good. All right, so now we're going to talk about so understand, we have pumps and channels, okay? two pumps, sodium potassium ion pump, all right, and the calcium pump. That's an active process. It requires ATP, all right, and they're going to move things against their concentration gradient. And we know the concentration gradient, because I just told you, banana floated in the ocean. More potassium inside the cell, because the banana is the, is the cell, all right? And then there's more sodium and chloride outside the cell. So the sodium potassium ion pumps moves sodium into the cell and moves potassium out of the cell. Don't switch that. Sorry. It moves. Oh, wait, hold on. That's the diffusion one. That's the leak one. Hold on. There we go. Okay. 
So the sodium potassium ion pump is going to move potassium into the cell and sodium out of the cell. All right? Keep that in mind. That's a passive process. But now, when we talk about the channels, we have three types. The leak channel, which those are always open, so think of something that's leaky, okay? And that allows whatever specific type of ion to diffuse down its concentration gradient. So if I have a sodium leak channel, that means sodium will now go into the cell. Here's the leak channel. I'll show it to you. There it is. There's a hole. Sodium goes in. Okay? Let's go there. I'll show you a potassium leak channel. Here's the potassium leak channel. Potassium goes out. That's it. They're always open. Okay? The other two types of channels are going to be the chemically gated channel, which means we needed some sort of chemical, and in this case a neurotransmitter, to open up that gate. And when it does open up, then whatever ion that it's specific for will diffuse down its concentration gradient. So if it's a chemically gated sodium channel, then sodium will diffuse into the cell. If it's a chemically gated potassium channel, the potassium will leave the cell. Okay? Voltage gated channels, same thing. Okay, except we need a change in the electrical charge across the plasma membrane. Okay, once it opens, then it diffuses down its concentration gradient. So we're going to talk about a very special channel. All right, it's very special to me. All right, it is called the, the voltage gated the voltage gated sodium channel. So it tells you first voltage that we need change the electrical charge across the plasma membrane, and then it tells you what type of ion that it's going to let pass through the channel. Now this is a special type of channel because it has two gates, folks. You need to know this. It's very unique. Okay, The voltage-gated potassium channel is not like this. Only the voltage-gated sodium channel. It's special. Okay, so there's three states that it can be in. The resting state, the activation state, and the inactivation state. I'm going to walk you through each one of these states, and then we'll take a break. Okay, the resting state, remember, all right, these gates are normally closed. Okay, I just said that in the previous slide. So in the resting state, okay, there's two gates. The first gate is called the activation gate. The second gate is called the inactivation gate. Let me show you a quick picture. I'll come right back, I promise you. Here is kind of the generalized picture of the voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay? So this little swing arm thing, that's the activation gate. You can't really see it very well, but kind of in the background, you have the inactivation gate, which are the, like these two small swellings. In the resting state, the activation gate, like a, a gate to your uh, chain link fence or your wooded privacy fence, it's closed. Okay? The inactivation gate is open. If any of these gates are closed, nothing can pass through. Okay? Nothing. <clears throat> okay? So we have no movement of sodium. It's not going anywhere. So now we get a change in the electrical charge across our plasma membrane. It stimulates the activation gate to open up. Okay? We change the charge. We'll talk about that later on. Okay? Well, there's only one gate that was closed. That's the activation gate. The inactivation gate is still open. So we activated the uh, activation gate. It's now open. Both gates are open. Sodium can move on through. Correct. Yes, Candace. This is, this is only for sodium. Potassium is different. It doesn't have an inactivation gate. <clears throat> you got it. Okay, so I'm going to come right back to this slide. I'll just show you what, what I'm talking about so you don't think I'm crazy. 
Okay, so we get a change. You can see here in our drawing, I'm not getting into the specifics. See, it's plus, it's positive outside the cell, negative inside the cell. All right, what did we do? We just flip flopped them. Okay, this is the resting state. So we change the charge, okay, we change the voltage that stimulates the opening of the activation gate. It now swings open. The inactivation gate is still open, so now sodium moves into the cell, right? It goes down its concentration gradient, right? Banana in the ocean, okay? Sodium outside, uh, out in the water there, it enters in, okay? So that is the activation uh, uh, state there. Okay, so then what will happen is, okay, the activation gate remains open, but the inactivation gate closes down. It's the first gate to close. Okay, so those little swellings that we saw here, here's the, here's the channel, all right? The activation gate is still open, but these swellings now just kind of bulge out like that, and they block the channel. So sodium cannot go in, all right? Sodium cannot travel in, okay? So again, we prevented the entry of sodium. Now this only occurs for a brief period of time. Really quick, but it's an important factor which we'll revisit later on when we get to the refractory portion, okay? It's brief, but this phenomena allows, all right, for this channel to then reset to the resting state. Okay, so it goes back to the inactivation gate opening and the activation gate closed. Let me show you. Here's the inactivation state. Okay, so the activation gate's still open, but those swellings have now pinched off the channel. So sodium cannot enter in anymore. All right, and then what will happen is it gives us a moment to reset everything back to the resting state, in which the inactivation gates will open up, but the activation gate swings closed. And we start it all over again, all right? So make sure it's really important that you understand this phenomena with the voltage-gated sodium channel. It's the only one that has two gates, okay? Well, I almost made it as far as I wanted to go. How did that seem? Did that seem so-so, not too, too bad? Okay, okay. Again, a lot of this chapter requires me to lay a lot of foundational work because then you can, you're going to build on top of it. And it's going to be reinforced because a lot when we get to muscles, all this kind of repeats itself in certain regards. And you'll see what I mean when I'm talking about that. All right, um, let's take a break. Okay, I knew as soon as I stopped... Uh, recording this, it's going to crash on me. If you have any questions, let's save it for the lab portion, okay? Um, all right, yeah, let's take about a 10, 15 minute break here real quick.